Lucky last, we've got a paramedic from Kuna. So Chris Munn started out as a vocational paramedic in Sydney. He was posted to Kuna Barabran, and he's there as a P1. And he says that while he's out there, if there's a work downturn, he spends his time doing online education and he's been part of a lot of inter-facility transfers. And we know what the roads are out, like out here. I've managed to avoid camels and goats in my time out here. Um, but he said that hopefully he can improve safety for our regional patients and that's what he's here to talk about today. Chris. Too easy. Thank you. So to start us off, can anyone who's had an absolute doozy of a hospital to hospital transfer please stand up? So I'm talking you've had a patient deteriorate along the way, you've arrived at the hospital with a patient in cardiac arrest, you've had to call for backup along the way, things just didn't feel right, nothing went well. For those up in the northwest corner of the state and the theatre, um, this is you delivering your patients to the aeroplanes. For any of the healthcare workers, this is you sending them out of your hospitals, or this is you receiving them. Stay standing if you learnt something from that transfer. So if you've reflected on it, you've changed your practice, you've improved things for the future for yourself, then stay standing. Now stay standing if you teach every single new person to your facility about hospital to hospital transfers and how to make them better for themselves or the patients. So you should only be standing now if you've taught every person you work with about hospital to hospital transfers. So that's why I'm down today. We're down here to talk about hospital to hospital transfers to try and make them better for all of us. So why is it important? Well, they're some of our most complex cases that we go to, and they're very common. They're people with multiple presenting problems. They've already received treatment, which is very different from our normal practices. They involve very long distances, sometimes over two hours and there's not much help for us while we're out on the road. They're also given very little attention. So there's not a lot of training that goes into hospital to hospital transfers, and there's a one-page protocol, compared to the hundreds of other pages that we read about triple O responses. There's a history of many inappropriate transfers taking place. So I know you can all stood up pretty much, so you've got a history within yourselves, multiply that across the whole organisation, and there's an ongoing problem with transfers not going well. Responsibility. So these transfers are organised by who? The sending doctor, nurses to start with, then they're organised by the receiving hospital, coordinated through vCare, MIU, the control centre then decides to send it down to your car. As soon as you take on that patient, the responsibility is yours. So I know a lot of the time, from most of the people that I talk to, we tend to downplay the responsibility of these jobs. Yeah, no worries, just another job, just another transfer. But when you actually sit down and think about it, that's someone's life that is in your hands for over two hours. And the decisions that you make prior to that transfer and during that transfer can significantly affect their life. So I'd just like to share a story now. Um, as I go through it, you'll probably notice the hundreds of things that we could have done better through this, and hopefully there's some there that you can learn from and draw on. So this case, I was a brand new level two to Coonabarabran Station. Um, we was called up during the night to a 17-year-old female benzo overdose. So the MDT, the computer in the car, read something like, 17-year-old female, benzo overdose, GCS 14, all the OBS between the flags to go through to Dubbo, which is roughly an hour 50 away. We walked through the doors of the emergency department. Doctor was sitting behind the desk. Patient was in the resus bed. No lights on, no nurses, no attention. Doctor said, patient's ready to go. Walked over to that patient. They were lying supine. They had an OPA taped onto their face with sports tape because they weren't quite tolerating it. They had a blood pressure of 85 and 55. 
they had decreased SATs, and they had a GCS of eight. So from there, I didn't really have a framework to work with. I didn't know what I should do. I didn't know what I was looking for. I just knew it did not feel right at that time. So we talked to the doctor about our concerns. The doctor immediately became quite agitated, angry towards us, and stated we just needed to go. We continued to explain that we had concerns with that patient. That doctor decided to administer naloxone, flumazenil, which is a benzo antagonist, pull out the OPA, put an NPA in, gave some fluids, some oxygen. She came up to a GCS 14. All of her observations moved to be between the flags. So I was starting to feel a little more confident, comfortable with that transfer. I asked the doctor how long that drug I'd never heard of, flumazenil, was going to last. He said, you'll be right all the way through to Dubbo. I asked for paperwork and a proper handover on that patient. He said I didn't need to know. He'd write it up, Dubbo Hospital would have all the information, didn't need to know, I just had to deliver the patient. So we left. We headed towards Dubbo with our patient. 20 minutes down the road, our patient deteriorated, back to a GCS8, back to needing some airway support, oxygen, and continual fluid boluses to keep that blood pressure up. We moved to urgently transport our patient. We arrived at Dubbo with a patient who was GCS8, needing some manual airway type maneuvers, lateral position, things like that, constant fluid boluses. They were expecting a patient that was nearly waiting room ready, and what we delivered them was a patient that needed an RSI and to spend some time in the ICU. A patient I knew nothing about. She wasn't very talkative on the way down. So from that, you can imagine the way that Dubbo thought I'd handled that case and the way that I felt. I felt we hadn't done a good job that day. So I was fortunate enough to be able to talk to wonderful paramedic Nicole Stone at Kuna Station and our educator, Alison Moffat, who sat down with me and did fantastic debriefs, non-judgmental, working on ways that we can improve it for the future. So I've come up with some things that will hopefully be able to improve it for everyone. So I've come up with a list of red flags. So these are just things that need to raise your concern uh, in the ED when you're in there. It doesn't mean if you find one of them, the transfer can't go ahead, ask for a sign off back to bed. They're not ambulance protocol red flags, they're just things that I've come up with that will hopefully help some people make some better decisions. So first up, imagine this. You've met someone online. Been talking to them, getting along absolutely fantastically. You've seen photos of them, and they're a stunner. 10 out of 10. You're pretty excited to go on your first date. You arrive at their house to pick them up. You open their front door. You're greeted with Dave. Dave is my boss, and actually out the back in a Wookiee costume, because he's that kind of guy. <laughs> <laughs> So the same applies to your MDT, that computer in the car. If it doesn't match the patient inside, then you need to be asking some questions, because the people that make the decisions on the transfer probably don't have the accurate information to get the appropriate disposition for that patient. Same as if you would pre-notify a hospital, given the description on the MDT, we need to be raising our level of concern there. If the observations on the MDT are to the number the exact same ones that you gave at triage, then you probably need to go in and make a real good assessment to make sure that patient's been monitored. Find the ED atmosphere is a good one. So we get to know our ED, our doctors, our nurses, and we get to develop a really good working relationship with them. If you walk in and they're particularly stressed, particularly, particularly anxious about a patient, then you need to take note of that. Same as if they're rushing you to take a patient out. So recently, we were greeted at the doors of Coonabarabran Hospital with, you need to hurry up and load and go. This patient's only got two hours to live. They're going to arrest. So immediately, with an hour 50 drive and a doctor saying patient had two hours to live, we were pretty concerned. Paperwork. So we need all of the appropriate paperwork. We need discharge summaries. We need what they've been given. 
We need advanced care directives. We need any sections if they've been completed. We can't leave the hospital until we've got all of that information. If you train your hospitals, essentially, to do that, they'll do it every time. You won't have to ask. They'll have it printed off and ready. You need to check for deterioration. So has there been a history of any deterioration over that patient's time in that hospital? Is there any expected deterioration for your trip through to your major hospital? Is there any ABC compromise? So as we all heard earlier, um, that's where the retrieval service offers the biggest bang for your buck interventions. So airway, breathing, circulation problems. So if you've got a patient who has a significantly compromised GCS and looking like they might lose their airway, we need to be securing that at your starting hospital, not somewhere in between in the back of a car. Same as if they're expected to have deterioration due to trauma. So if they're in airway burns, we don't want to be trying to figure that out half an hour into our trip. Breathing. If they're needing CPAP, BiPAP in your hospital, then chances are you're not going to be able to provide that service the whole way through to the end destination. Circulation. If they need blood products, if they're needing constant vasoactive support, then you can't provide that most of the time on the way down. Paramedic safety. So we need to be asking questions about whether that patient has got a history of aggression, especially towards healthcare workers. If they've got a history of aggression and they're still quite alert and agitated, then they're not going to be safe to chuck in a car and drive through to your major hospital. And your gut. So if it just doesn't feel right, then we probably need to be doing something about it. So important information to gather. That thorough handover and paperwork. Make sure you get it. We can't leave without grabbing it. Treatments and trends. So what's the hospital done for that patient and what's happened since they did it? If they've given medications that they expected to be effective and they've turned out that they've not been effective, then we need to be asking questions why. Why haven't those medications worked for that patient? Have they got their provisional diagnosis right? Paramedic assessment. So we all know as soon as we arrive at an ED with a patient, triage nurse takes our, takes our report, goes and sees the patient. The same should apply to us. We get our handover, we get our information, and then we go and make our own assessment of the patient. If they've handed over that the respirate 16, and we can see the patient in a tripod position with a respirate of 36, then we need to be asking, are we the most appropriate resource at the moment? Is the patient aware, prepared, and packaged? So do they know that they're going through to a different hospital? Does their family know that they're going through to a different hospital? For lots of our small towns out here, this might be the last chance they ever get to see their family members. I think we need to afford them that opportunity. Are they prepared? So is their pain managed? Unmanaged pain in the ED is definitely going to be unmanaged pain in the back of an ambulance. Have they been to the toilet? I personally just don't like dealing with that on the way through. <laughs> I'm sure it's no good for the patients either. Do they get travel sick? If they get travel sick travelling forwards in a car, they're definitely getting travel sick in an ambulance travelling backwards. We can provide an antiemetic in the hospital and stop that from happening. And are they packaged? So do they have the appropriate access, everything that you're going to need for the transfer? Do you know what's running through the infusions? Also ask the doctor what the expected treatment is for that patient. So if they think that patient's going to deteriorate, then you want to know, and you want to know what we're going to do about it. It's much nicer to have a plan in place when things do happen for a patient, rather than finding out half the way down and having to come up with your own plan. So some solutions that you can try. I find this one to be by far the most effective. Consult with your doctor in the ED and see if they can come up with a plan. So, for instance, if they've got a lower leg fracture or something, and they're in significant pain in that ED that's not being controlled by opiates, adding more opiates like we do is not going to be particularly effective, definitely down a bumpy road. The doctor quite often might suggest that they can do a nerve block, happy days, no need to smash them with opiates, patient's pain is managed, we can travel through quite safely. 
So let them come up with solutions for you and help to fix the problem and make it better for our patients. Also consider waiting to make sure that those treatments are effective for that patient before leaving. Same applies to if you're like we were 20 minutes down the road when the patient deteriorates. Consider pulling over, spending that two minutes to reassess and make sure that it's still most appropriate that you keep going. You can always turn around and head back to your closest hospital. If you take nothing else away from this one today, please take this point. So if you can't get a solution with your patient, please, please radio through to the control centre, ask the doctor to give you a call, they'll patch you usually through to vCare, and you have a chat about your concerns. They're particularly helpful at finding solutions for you, finding alternate transport methods, or reassuring you. Quite often they might say, I don't expect the patient to deteriorate, I think you'll be okay, but if this happens, you can do this, this, and this. Recently, a paramedic out at Baradine told me a story of how the VK doctor rang him during the job and explained that it wasn't ideal that they were going through to Dubbo by ambulance, there was no other resources, but here are some tools that you can use along the way if things do change, and reassured him that they were the most appropriate resource, although they would have rathered have helicopter or plane there. You can get additional resources from New South Wales Ambulance or Health. So that's asking for another P1, if you need another P1 in the car, if you need an ICP, ICP skills, if you want to discuss the job with a DOM, your SO, an educator, highly encourage you to do that if you're not feeling right about it. If you need health resources, this can also be organised. So midwives, nurses, doctors, anything like that is definitely a solution. Providing management outside of our scope. So what medications can we give outside of our scope? Lots of people I've heard say, yeah, there's a reference section with the medications that we can give. If you read that one-page protocol, we can give any medications except for blood products. But we need to be comfortable with those medications. So we can't go and administer things that are high risk, that we don't know anything about, and that are going to cause harm to our patients when there's other solutions. If it's a particularly low-risk medication but still needs to be given, and you're aware of the adverse effects, the contraindications for it, the endpoints, what will happen if it stops, and you feel comfortable, then you can go ahead. Urgent transport doesn't save us a whole heap of time in reality, and just jumping in the car and driving faster and faster and faster isn't overly a solution to what's going on. But it's definitely an option to keep in the toolkit to get us there a little bit quicker. Pre-notification. That was something in the case study that went particularly wrong for us. What I've found is quite effective is giving notification before you leave your hospital with all of your details, and then 20 minutes out, provide an update. So they might get a two-hour ETA. 20 minutes out, a lot of the time it's condition as stated, we'll be with you in 20. That's quite easy to do while you're driving. Alternate transport. So it might be that your conversation with vCare, they might say, no, 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 it's not appropriate that you take it. So going back to that patient, I said we arrived at the hospital, they said they'll be dead within two hours. I gathered some more information, politely excused ourselves, went outside, made the phone call, went through to vCare, and they said we had no idea the patient was in that condition. We're going to organise a helicopter. In the end, that patient got flown through to Dubbo a couple of hours later. Now, whilst that didn't save that patient's life, they died three, three days later in Dubbo anyway, there's one thing that that family remembers from that day. Um, I've caught up with them since, and they said, the only people that we saw properly care for their husband was the ambulance. They said, you properly advocated for him, and if it wasn't for you, we think he would have died in the ED, and we wouldn't have got the chance to say goodbye in Dubbo ICU. So I think that's definitely worth it. If we're advocating for our patients, it's not only the patient, but it's the entire family. So where to from here? Please, please, please remember that if it just doesn't feel right, have that conversation with the doco and get patched through to the people that booked the job. They'll either reassure you or provide some alternate sort of ideas. And then at the start, when I talked about 
who trains everyone they come across? I think there was only a couple of people left standing. I think next time this presentation is given, it'd be great to see everyone standing. If everyone talks to the people that you work with, tells everyone that's new to your facilities about hospital to hospital transfers, all of a sudden it gets much safer for all of our patients and no paramedics have to have sleepless nights about it. So thank you.